Uh, well, good evening and thank you. Welcome to the second of the ongoing Nike-sponsored Sports and Social Change Speaker Series. Uh, we want to thank Nike, the Nike company once again for their generous support for this forum for academic and professional discussion of issues in sports and sports media. Uh, we want to thank the Dean for welcoming you, welcoming you all. Uh, and uh, you may or may not know this, the Dean was up for uh, reassignment here uh, just recently and has signed a new contract for another five years at Annenberg. Uh, so he will be the Dean. <laughs> he will be the Dean at Annenberg long after I'm doddering off into the sunset and <laughs> drooling on myself. So this, this evening our program is titled, For the Good of the Game, the NFL at a Crossroads. A little over a month ago, the Super Bowl produced the highest ratings of any event in the history of television. Yet today, the National Football League stands at a crossroads. From Michael Vick to the player lockout to Dave Duerson's suicide, the league's public image is in crisis. We've gathered together a truly distinguished panel of experts and practitioners to discuss the league's uh, image in and out of the media. And I'd like to introduce our panel members uh, first before we start talking, in case you don't know any of them, and if you don't know any of them, you haven't been reading the papers lately or, or over the last number of years. First, we have a legend in sports representation, the foremost agent representing NFL athletes, and the inspiration for the lead character of the movie, Jerry Maguire, uh, the head of Lee Steinberg Enterprises, Lee Steinberg. In only his second year in the league, uh, already the winningest postseason quarterback in the New York Jets uh, history, which says a lot about the quarterback and may say a little bit about the Jets. <laughs> <laughs> the star quarterback of your New York Jets and formerly your USC Trojans, Mark Sanchez. Now, arguably, and Mark may give us an argument on this, arguably the most successful college quarterback of all time, Heisman Trophy winner, two-time national champion, the first recipient of the Manning Trophy, and uh, current NFL veteran, Matt Leinert. Tomorrow. We also have the wide receiver and the deep threat of the legendary 1985 Chicago Bears football team, a team that is often identified, and by the way, don't hit me. Uh, a team that is often identified by people as the greatest football team, uh, NFL football team of all time. And one of the fastest men ever to play a game. He was all, play the game of football. He was also a member of the ill-fated 1980 U.S. Olympic team. That's a lot to say. Willie Galt. With a 12-year career in the NFL as offensive tackle and also offensive tackle for the Super Bowl 18 champion Los Angeles Raiders, we have Shelby Jordan. Hey. And also defensive back for the Super Bowl 39 champion San Francisco 49ers uh, and uh, lovingly known as the dude, Toy Cook. <laughs> I want to talk a little bit about the NFL's image this evening, and all of these people have had, ha, had to deal with one form or another of, of public image uh, and public, public image issues. Uh, but our practitioner here on the panel is Lee Steinberg, so I want to start with you, Lee. First of all, to talk a little bit about the, the NFL's uh, current public image, what do you see as the greatest strengths and the greatest weaknesses of the public image of the NFL today? I think that what's critical is that the real battle in football is not labor versus management. It's the battle of the NFL against basketball, baseball, home box office, Walt Disney World, and every other form of discretionary entertainment spending. The reason this sport is by two to one the most popular sport really in the history of American sports is that we've had uninterrupted play since 1987. And all of the focus has gone on building, as well as possible, the brand of football, not force-feeding fans an unremitting diet of newspaper scandals, hassles, force-feeding them that. Fans are not going to be empathetic here at all with millionaires fighting billionaires. Um, so the quieter this collective bargaining can be, the better. Football's done a superb job of turning out role models. Um, and 
you don't get that sense reading the um, business uh, part of the newspaper or the crime beat section mm -hmm. because you have more blogs, more um, coverage than ever before, and it amplifies a, a minor incident. So that when Ryan Leaf gives a bad interview in a locker room, after you've seen it a thousand times, in your mind's eye, every player is doing that all the time. Mm. And when Michael Vick gets, uh, has a problem with, uh, with dog fighting, which is a, was not a wonderful thing, you see it repetitively over and over again on, on television, on ESPN. You listen to it over and over again. So it's really critical that players watch their public behavior. When I take a rookie, the first thing we say is, if you don't want to be um, a role model, if you're not willing to go back to the high school, collegiate, and professional community and set up charitable and community programs, if you don't want to graciously give autographs, if you don't want to graciously talk to the press, go play on the sandlot. But if you want all the great largesse that uh, football has to offer, you have to be a role model. So right now we're in a, a, a labor dispute but I've told my friends, pay attention to baseball, you know, watch March Madness. Um, this won't settle until it has to settle. And it doesn't have to settle in the off season. March uh, 4th was, a, was not a deadline that meant anything, neither was March 11th. Um, we don't do anything in football till the last minute. Um, I've had 60 first round draft picks and the very first pick in the draft eight times. And none of those negotiations that with players that got drafted in April get going till very late. Um, we do everything at the last minute in the NFL. But the NFL is way too smart to fall into the trap that basketball, baseball, and hockey did of alienating people and pushing it away. We've been very clever about building ancillary revenue streams, NFL network, overseas play, rotisserie, fantasy, every form of enjoying it better. That's where the energy's gone. And really, there hasn't been that much disruption in this NFL strike. It'll end, there'll be a new agreement, and football will go on to greater years. This is a quick follow-up to that. You talked a little bit about the player's image, and it, it does, it's inextricably tied up with the team. Exactly. In your case, I, I know you've dealt with players who have had uh, significant issues uh, in the past. Uh, for instance, when, when you have a player such as Ricky Williams, who, who clearly is, is causing himself more harm than good, how do you deal with helping them reconstruct their image, uh, especially if they aren't that interested in reconstructing it? First of all, I got to give you the best two lines from when the group of us were stuck in the uh, <laughs> elevator, okay? First of all, we're stuck there for a half hour, and Willie says, uh oh, it's always the black guy that gets killed first in these movies. <laughs> And then Mark Sanchez starts putting up numbers like we've been stuck in there day after day. You know? <laughs> um, the, the key in crisis control for an athlete um, who gets into uh, trouble in some way or another is to, to follow this general uh, outlook. First of all, if an athlete does something that is against public policy or against <coughs> the way people feel, he needs to first of all admit it, take ownership, <coughs> second of all, and quickly get his arms wrapped around all of the facts, take ownership of it, state the standard, it's not right to get in a car with any alcohol in your system, dog fighting's wrong, whatever it is. Apologize to every relevant constituency and say that he's taken steps to prevent a recurrence. Once you can do that, the healing can happen. The healing can go on. But until that, if you, an athlete tries to sleaze around the issue or uh, in some way waits too long, <coughs> that's where it gets bad. And I always remember that the fans are the ultimate employers. So Ricky Williams had a problem. And the way the substance abuse program is supposed to work is it's supposed to treat players. Instead, mm -hmm. they punish players. 
And when Ricky finally got some help, his, his uh, whole situation uh, cleaned up. But my practice for 37 years has been based on role modeling. Mm -hmm. And when an athlete stands up, when you have um, uh, players like uh, uh, Tim McDonald, who's uh, I think here tonight, you know, set up a charitable or community program. When Lennox Lewis stands up and says, real men don't hit women, it can do more to uh, influence behavior in young adolescents towards domestic violence than a thousand authority fig figures can ever do. When Warren Moon, who's been my client for 35 years, sets a the Crescent Moon Foundation and sends kids to college, mm -hmm. one after another after another, and you can sit in a room and watch a whole auditorium rise that have all gone to college on his scholarships. Athletes have a terrific uh, uh, ability to do that. Mm -hmm. You know, Mark Sanchez today is the hottest young player in the NFL. And if he stands up and says, I'm going to uh, make a difference like we did with uh, Ben Roethlisberger years ago for tsunami relief, it impacts people. Uh, mm -hmm. Matt Leiner has always been a superlative role model, um, as Shelby was in Will Willie War. These athletes have the opportunity to make a massive difference in the world if they use that role properly. Uh, speaking of using the role and the image of uh, a player related to the image of a team, Shelby, I know you've, you have sought to have a positive impact civically uh, and on the young especially. Uh, your most famous years, however, are with a team that had a, a, a very, uh, if we could call it negative reputation, certainly a reputation uh, that, that uh, greatly influenced a lot, of, uh, a lot of gangster rap and others to see this as the alternative uh, kind of gangster team, the LA Raiders. Uh, how, how do you uh, juggle that kind of public image with the image you want to project? Well, my first eight years in the National Football League was with the New England Patriots. I was originally drafted by the Houston Oilers out of Washington University in St. Louis, Missouri as the first player in the history of the university to get drafted into the NFL. I played there at, the at Washington University as, an off as a defensive lineman and a linebacker, uh, defensive tackle for three years uh, and a linebacker, middle linebacker my last year, and I got drafted to the Houston Oilers as an offensive tackle and ultimately ended up negotiating my own contract my first year with the Houston Oilers, which was ill-received because the Oilers said to me when I told them that I was re representing myself, you know, who do you think you are, some black kid from some school that no one's ever heard of from before talking about coming to Texas and talking, talking for yourself, but don't you know Texas is bigger than life? And I thought, well, I'm the one who's going to have to fulfill these responsibilities. I thought that, you know, would be well received. They say, so what do you want? I said, I want a house. I want a car. I want an insurance policy. I want you to pay for my graduate school education. And I want so much in salary. They say, we're not giving you any of that. I say, you're not? I say, I'm not coming. They say, you aren't? I say, no, I have a college degree. I'm going to go get a job. <laughs> so my orientation to pro football is somewhat different than the other gentlemen who are here in as much as it wasn't anything that I aspired to as a young person growing up in East St. Louis, Illinois. I'm the seventh and last child of parents who were laborers. My father was a union laborer for some 34, 34 some odd years from outside a chemical company and I learned to work when I was a young kid and I had jobs all the time. I put my age up at 14 to work in a mattress factory uh, as, one, as, as one example. When I started school at Washington University I had to go through the career scholarship program that required me to go to school at night and work full time during the day. I was a pre-med student but Washington University had a football team that allowed me to play. So when I got an opportunity to play in the National Football League, it didn't work in Houston. I held out of camp. Ultimately, you know, they called me back after I told them I wasn't going to report and said, did you change your mind? I said, no. Did you change your mind? They said, no. So I hung up the phone. And that was it. You know? So that went on for several weeks. And then finally, I reported to training camp at, uh, at the Shriners Institute in uh, Kerrville, Texas, which is where the Oilers were having training camp at that particular time. I went from the taxi squad to injury reserve and after having been on injury reserve they decided that well actually I was on the taxi squad the general manager what happened to walk by me and say well we're going to put you on the taxi squad uh, on the injury reserve and pay you half your salary so something said don't say anything just wait until you get your first paycheck and so I did 
Sure enough, it was one half of one fourteenth of what I signed for. And I didn't really know what to do. We were staying at the Shamrock Hilton Hotel in Houston at that time. So I called the league office and said, I know what I'll do. I'll call the league office and ask them what my status is, registered there in the National Football League office. And the guy came back to the phone. He said, we have you listed here as an injured reserve. I said, could you please tell me what that means? And he told me, he says, injured, you're injured and it's not likely you're going to come back and play during the course of the season. And so I knew what, what it all meant, but I wanted to hear from him. And so I said, well, does that mean that I'm entitled to my full contract salary, what I, what I signed for? And the guy's, the guy's voice changed. He said, by all means, are you having a problem? <laughs> and at that point, I became nervous. I said, yes, sir, and I wish you'd call and talk to someone. And I put the phone down. Well, the general manager called me over to the office about an hour later and basically walked over to me and put his finger in my face. And he said, son, you don't know when people are trying to be good to you. And with all the courage I could muster, I said, sir, obviously not. Can I have the other half of my paycheck and my plane ticket home? And I left. Took a job in a managerial training program in Downers Grove, Chicago. And the New England Patriots was one of the teams who contacted me and wanted to know if I was still interested in playing pro football. And I didn't want to go through life wondering if it was something that I could do because I was a kid that most of the children made fun of as a kid growing up. My folks were church-going folks. They were religious folks. And I wasn't a mean kid. I grew late. I grew from 5'10 to 6'4 in three years of high school. Went from 180 pounds to 225 pounds when I was 14 until I was 17. And in one summer before I entered Washington University, I grew from 6'4 six foot six foot to 6'7 in one summer and went from 225 to 240 pounds. Well, all, all of that, all, all of that, all, all of that happened so quickly, many of the young people that I'd gone to high school with remembered that I wasn't very good. So when I'd see them, when I'd come home to go to church on Sunday with my folks, they'd make fun of me still, even when the newspapers started to write about me and what I was doing. And my father saw me one day, he saw my expression, he said, don't listen to what they're saying about you. Keep your mouth shut mind your own business, and keep trying. And ultimately, after that, I was drafted into the National Football League. But the point that I'm making, and when I went to the New England Patriots, Sam Cunningham was one of the leaders of that team at that time. And we were a young offensive line. Red Miller was the offensive line coach. Chuck Fairbanks, who was recently out of Oklahoma, was the head coach. And I thought that the Patriots would give me an opportunity to learn how to play offensive tackle, a position I'd never played before. We were a young team. We became a very good team. And we did a lot of great things as an offensive team over an eight-year period. So when I came to the Raiders, getting back to the question that you asked me. <laughs> I was wondering when we'd get there. Wow. Can my, you run over all that again, though? No, well, I can't. I can't. But my, my wife and I were in graduate school finishing up our master's in business administration. And we had bought a bottled water company in Narragansett, Rhode Island, that had been the principal source of drinking water for the southern part of Rhode Island during that time, and we had joined the International Bottled Waters Association, and we had it on the precipice of opening, and I needed a new contract, and so I told the Patriots, look, I'm not going to play for what you're offering me for this year, because I know if I get hurt, you're not going to give me a better contract afterward. And so I ended up sitting out of camp for 37 days, being fined a thousand bucks a day, and they waited, as you said, Lee, there's not a sense of urgency until there has to be one. And so at that particular point, I, I didn't show up for 37 days of training camp. And ultimately, at the end of that period of time, the bottom of the negotiations fell out when we thought we had an agreement in principle. And I got a call from Al Davis. Al said to me, Shelby, this is Al Davis. I want she to become a Raider. I said, Mr. Davis, I got a wife, a kid, and a mortgage I can afford. What the heck am I going to do in California? He said, we're going to give you all the money that was on the table when they pulled the deal. I said, OK, Mr. Davis. <laughs> I said, you got an offensive tackle. I watched him play. I'm not watching anybody play at this point in my career. He says, we're going to move him in the right guard, and we're going to put you in right tackle. I said, OK. <laughs> So, so then I said to him, I said, you know, Mr. Davis, I got a, I, I got a business at its pre-opening stages. I'm not going to walk off and leave it. I was 31 years old at the time having this conversation with Mr. Davis. He says, what kind of business is it? I said, it's a bottled water company. He paused. He says, I don't know anyone in bottled water. <laughs> he says, I got a few friends who own wineries. <laughs> Then he hesitated again. He says, but I tell you what, if I don't know who the right people are, 
I'll find out who they are. And then he said something to me that no one had ever said to me in my entire life. He says, I preface what I'm about to say with humility. They'll be glad to meet me. <laughs> so I said to myself, Mr. Davis, I'm coming. I told my wife, I said, look, you and young Shelby stay here. We had him in a school that we had to put his name on the list when he was born and in order to get him into the school, Henry Barnard School back in Rhode Island. And I said, I'm going to go to California and find out if this is all for real. And I came here. It was one of the greatest football teams that I have been associated with. And at the end of that season, we won this. So I said to my wife after the season, <laughs> I said to my wife after the season was over, sweetheart, I understand if there are any residual benefits of being on the championship team is in the city where the team is located, so we're going to temporarily relocate to Southern California. We're originally from the St. Louis area, so she says, okay, and so we've been visiting Los Angeles area for the last 27 years. Mark and Matt, that's what a Super Bowl ring looks like. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> pass it down there too. <laughs> pass, pass it down. <laughs> we, we lock in an elevator. And we just brag about it. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, Mark and Matt, uh, speaking of going into the league, both of you went into the league from USC, but with very different tri uh, tracks. And I'll start with Matt and move over to Mark on this. Um, in your case, uh, you left USC as one of the most bonded quarterbacks in the history of college football, uh, had a huge name, uh, a name appeal. You almost immediately walked into uh, a television commercial that played you as the favored son of Archie Manning over uh, Peyton and that other guy, Eli. Um, <laughs> And in that case, you, you, you came in with an immense amount of NFL sex appeal, uh, something that most people don't walk into the NFL with. Mm. Uh, you know, what was your experience going yeah, from USC to the NFL? <laughs> <laughs> Oddly, why does he look at Mark when he says that? Uh, it, uh, Mark has a different story. Mark just pissed off Pete Carroll. But um, <laughs> we'll, we'll get to that story in a little bit. Uh, but, but what was that transition for you, moving from really uh, the center of the college universe uh, off to the NFL? Um, obviously, I mean, to, to date now, you know, it hasn't gone as planned. But, um, I mean, 21 years old, um, you know, at USC, we, were, we always like to think we're kind of like an NFL team because the, the Raiders left and the Rams weren't here. And um, we were enjoying so much success and, um, you know, I mean, even Mark's teams, and we just had, you know, NFL draft picks year after year. So um, kind of the step, you know, me personally probably being naive and immature, you know, didn't think it was going to be that big of a step. And, um, you know, ha enjoying so much success in college, you just think, think automatically, okay, in the pros, it's going to happen as well. And um, for me, you know, it's been an interesting – this is my sixth season coming up, so an interesting five and a half years. And um, my rookie year, I enjoyed, you know, some success. I started 11 games. And – um, you know, everything was going well, and then, you know, we had a coaching change, and um, a new coach came in, and um, right away, you know, we just, we kind of butted heads, you know, I think that's out there in the public, everyone knows it, and, um, you know, then, unfortunately, I got hurt my second year and broke my collarbone and was on injured reserve the whole season, and um, that's when it kind of hit me to where, okay, what am I doing, I got to start and I got to, and it wasn't that I didn't take the game serious. I just was learning how to prepare as a young as a young kid. You know, I was learning the game, um, and fortunately, I had Kurt Warner to learn from. You know, who we battled for three, four years, and um, a great one of the great competitors I've ever played with and known. And you know, I'm trying to find my way back. You know, and I think uh, um, Arizona, I look at it as a learning experience, and I look at everything that's happened to me as a learning experience. You know, I don't really regret anything, and. Um, you know, there's been a lot of, there's been negative things, there's been positive things, and I think I've always kind of just taken everything with a grain of salt, learned from my mistakes, and moved on. And um, I've, I feel for the first time getting released by Arizona, going to Houston last year was probably the best thing that's happened to me. You know, and, and obviously the future, I don't know what's going to happen, but um, it kind of just regained my confidence as a quarterback, um, learning from Coach Kubiak and, and all the guys there that have played the position. And um, so for me, it all hasn't been, you know, roses and, and everything, but um, 
I enjoy football. I love this game. And, you know, I'm just still finding my path, you know. And, like, you know, we all have a different path to get to the top. And um, I'm just taking the, the, the detour. But <laughs> but in, in, in many respects, um, do you find the early fame uh, an albatross or a difficulty for you? Uh, because uh, somebody who goes into the league who has relatively, is relatively unknown, can go anywhere and do anything and slowly learn the game. Uh, if you sneeze, it's going to make it mm -hmm. onto the national news. Uh, do, do you find that uh, an even greater challenge? Yeah, I think the pressure was extremely high um, for you know for myself, for Reggie, you know, guys that came out in that class, and um, you know, I mean, you know, we're you know we graduate and you know Heisman Trophy winners. Then, like you said, there's commercials and there's all these things, and this is before we've even played a down of NFL football. So. Mm -hmm. Um, when you get to your team, you know, I think football is a game, you know, it's a game of respect. It's about earning your respect on the mm -hmm. field. And, um, you know, and that's something that, you know, I think, I didn't think it was going to be handed to us because I understand football and I understand how difficult it is as a sport to, to have success. But um, I just think the pressure was, was hard, you know, and um, it took probably some stuff to happen to realize that, okay, this is, this is a business, you know. Um, I need to be accountable for my actions. I mean, I need to be accountable to my teammates uh, and gain their respect as a player, as a person. And, um, you know, and I, and I think I've done that. You know, I haven't, I unfortunately, haven't been able to play the last couple of years, but I've definitely learned um, a whole great deal about this game and about um, being a person and being an NFL player. Mm -hmm. yeah, USC quarterbacks find it difficult to leave the university quietly. And Mark? Uh, is another example. Of, uh, <laughs> although you took the, 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 some of the best classes you had your last semester here. However, <laughs> uh, you also at the same time ran into a situation uh, not all that usual or all that common in college football. Your coach called you out for leaving the team and moving on to the NFL. Uh, what was your reaction internally to that when, he, when that, that situation started to happen? I think I was a little surprised. I think uh, I was, uh, I don't know if I was worried. I think I knew that if you know Coach Carroll like Matt does, um, he's so competitive. And to me, it became a competition for him to try and get me back and me to want to leave. And I knew what I wanted. I don't think um, everybody in my family totally agreed. Um, but I just knew it. And I remember I sat in my apartment on Ellendale the night before I announced in um, Heritage Hall. And Coach Carroll came over, and we're sitting there talking. And he's like, you know I don't agree with you. And I said, I know, Coach. I'm just telling you, I, I feel this. This is right for me. This is what I want. He's like, OK, I'm, I'm not going to agree with you. I said, OK, that's fine. You don't have to agree. I'm not asking you to agree. I just want to do it the right way and, and leave on good terms, and everything will be fine. And then we get to the press conference, and I'm expecting him to say, you know, well, we had a great you know, time with Mark here, and, and we wish him the best. And then he kind of said what he said, and I was like, whoa. I didn't know he, he didn't agree that much. So it was like, I didn't know he was going to publicly disagree. But it, um, that's kind of the way it went. And uh, as soon as that happened, I mean, we're here talking about media and the NFL, and this kind of stuff spirals out of control if you let it. And so immediately, you know, I took it as, hey, look, He's a competitive coach. I'm going to take that as a sign of respect. I have no disdain towards Coach Carroll, towards the program. They've given me everything to this point. I'm so proud to be a Trojan. And I'm going to move on and just kind of take the high road and don't even worry about it and not get into some media battle with Coach Carroll about it because it wasn't worth it. And I knew it could take a real negative turn and um, maybe look bad for the program, look bad for me trying to come out in the draft. So to me, it wasn't even worth getting into a media spat match or anything like that. And I knew deep down inside, I knew Coach Carroll was still going to root for me. I knew he was still going to be proud of me no matter what happened. And um, so I just I tried to think about stay positive and then use it as a little fuel. Like, OK, you know, I'm going into a workout at the Combine with all these other guys in shorts. These guys think they're better than me. Maybe Coach Carroll thinks these guys are better than me, too. All right, OK, watch this throw. You know, watch this. Watch me do that. Boom. And that just kind of got things going. And then. Um, like Matt was talking about, and this is one of the most important things to understand is people talk about, oh, Stafford didn't do as well as you, and you were the fifth pick. He was the first pick. You should have gone number one. It, this whole thing is timing. This whole thing is coaching and hitting your stride at the right time. Going through a coaching change like Matt had to do, I mean, that would be so tough. If a coach comes in and takes Rex Ryan's job and that coach doesn't like me, 
I'm out. There's, I mean, if he's in with, with the owners, this is political, this is business stuff, so it's, it's hard for people to understand that. And um, things have really hit in the right place. And I, I've worked hard, sure, behind the scenes, but things have really hit in the right place. So um, to me, it just, I mean, it kills me when you hear people say stuff like, yeah, you know, things didn't work out for Liner, but they worked out for you. I'm like, okay, you guys have no idea how lucky I've been, how fortunate I've been. I've landed at a place where a coach has given me total freedom to throw five picks in a game and still start the next game. There's not many, <laughs> there's not many coaches that let you do that. So, um, that's, that's kind of where this Speaking of thing facing up to things. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, by the way. Um, so, it's, uh, it's been a great experience overall, and, and I took that. You know, I knew that there was going to be, um, you know, some tough times going through this decision, and I knew that not everybody was going to agree with me, even my head coach from college. And I had to go with, with what I truly believed and live it out to be the right decision, and that's what I've tried to do so far. Well, some people begin under the microscope, and some people uh, <coughs> get large in public uh, over their careers. I just have a question for the panel. Uh, how many people on the panel here have been the star of an MTV uh, music video? <laughs> I think that would be Willie. Uh, Super Bowl Shuffle. <laughs> Super Bowl Shuffle. Uh, actually, in 1985, Willie Gall played for the uh, champion Chicago Bears, a, a team that had, some people say, so much chutzpah, some people say so much vanity, uh, that they, they produced a Super Bowl Shuffle video uh, on their way to the Super Bowl championship. Uh, now, do you remember the, the lyrics? Uh, of course. Yeah. <laughs> Would it be possible for you to repeat us for them? Of course not. <laughs> well, actually, I have them. <laughs> yeah, I'm okay. sure you do, right? Uh, the, the, going into that situation, uh, this, this is not a time when it was common, obviously, for, for uh, professional football teams uh, to, to play this kind of uh, larger-than-life uh, ego uh, performance in front of people. Uh, you're part of the uh, part of the Bears, and that was part of their persona. Just like the Raiders, they had kind of the uh, the, the aggressive per persona. You had the persona of being a team that was so confident that you could not possibly lose uh, that you would make a Super Bowl shuffle video. Uh, being on that team, what what, were your, what are your reflections on the image of that team and and playing, you know, performing as a character who essentially needs to fit that image if you're going to, to play? Well, first of all, I have the privilege of playing with both the Raiders and the Bears, so yeah. I guess you call <laughs> so you that got both. Yeah, 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 true. Also, real brief, I have to make a comment on the elevator comment. I have to put it in perspective. We were there talking about elevators, it seemed like a movie, and then the, the, the fireman came and said, okay, grab, put your hand through the door and try to open it. So I had my hand inside the elevator, and everyone, everyone was worried about I was going to break my hand or cut it off. And I go, yeah, that's right, because the black guy always die first in the movie. <laughs> so that was basically the way. It was funny. It was funny. It was funny. <laughs> and we were trying to play, so it was pretty cool. Swift becoming right, actually, right. Yeah, right. That's right. It's, it, was, it was nice, actually. We had a good time there. Right, exactly. Right. Very good time. Yeah. But first, also, I, I think for me and these guys here, uh, to play in the National Football League is a privilege. And it's something that you earn. You don't just get it. We all earned it. And we all had a great time doing it. And they still are playing. Um, the, the Bears were a special team. I was drafted uh, in 1983, first round, or the Bears. I came in late because I was running track at the World Championship in Helsinki. So I came in late and uh, I signed, at, I guess, the third, game, third preseason game into camp and came in, got a chance to start as my rookie year and, and had a lot of success. Uh, but we developed a sort of, uh, I guess, cockiness, but yet confidence because I think our defense was just so good in 1985. Buddy Ryan put together the 46 defense, which he had all the characters. He had Mike Singletary, who was the most amazing linebacker you ever want to see. He had Richard Dent, who was a great defensive end. Actually, he was a free agent. And he came on, of course, to be an all-pro. You had Wilbur Marshall, Dan Hampton, uh, the Fridge, who was just this guy who was so big. I mean, Fridge was probably about 370 pounds, give or take a little. He was 6'1". But the thing, about, the, the thing about Fridge is that he could stand underneath the basketball goal and dunk, it ball, and dunk the ball with, with two hands. So he was a great athlete. So we had a great team. And, and what happened is this. I was, in, I was in Chicago. I did a video call. Um, the heat in me with Linda Clifford. So it was at the beginning of our season. And while I did this video, I know it's dating me, um, <laughs> the producer and I said, well, why don't we just make a video of the Bears? And I go, okay, this, this would be pretty hard because these guys are all like really egos and they're really 
bad, bad guys to deal with. And he said, okay, well, who would you pick to put in, put in the, be in the video? So I had a dubious job of telling these guys to try to convince them to do a video called the Super Bowl Shuffle before we've gone to the Super Bowl. Now, mind you, we, we had played San Francisco the year prior to that, and I think they won the Super Bowl that year, and, and they had beat us in the championship game. So we were determined to go to the Super Bowl. So we put this uh, Super Bowl Shuffle together. I helped write and produce and get the guys together. And so we came in, each guy said their lines, and we, we did the album. We, we put out the record first, and it went really well. So we, we um, said, okay, we're gonna shoot the video on week 13. We had a Monday night game. We'll do it on that Tuesday because the Tuesdays I get our game off. So we're, we're, we're now 12 and 0, okay? We're going to Miami for our 13th game, trying to break history with the undefeated season. We're going to Monday night. We play Miami. Jim McMahon gets hurt. He's not in the, in the game. So we lose the game, okay? Miami beats us, and we're now, we lost the game, and everyone's really sad. On the, on the plane on the way back, people go, I'm not coming tomorrow to do the video. It, it doesn't make sense, and you know, it's an omen, we're gonna lose. And I said, no, we have to do it because we've already committed, we've already, you know, we, we've done all these things, we have to do it. So we all pulled together and said, look, let's come and make this a team effort to reunite ourselves. And so we came that day, we did the video, and it was fantastic, and everyone participated. And of course, the, the things that I'm most proud about the video is that we, were number two on the all-time selling this video behind Michael Jackson's Thriller, which was great. We, we were nominated for a Grammy. We, we lost to Prince, believe it of all people. So Michael Jackson and Prince, two biggest people, um, and we gave over $250,000 to the neediest families in Chicago, which was amazing. So it was, it was a good thing, and I, I really enjoyed uh, being there and being a part of that team. So, and, and by the way, uh, Mark and Matt, this is what a, an almost Grammy winner looks like. So. <laughs> but but I, I do have a Super Bowl ring, too. Yeah, you do have a Super Bowl ring. <laughs> and I was going to say, another man who has a Super Bowl ring. I, now, Willie brought something up. <laughs> Willie brought something up that actually uh, is of, of a lot of interest to me. David Hill, the CEO of Fox Sports, sat up on this stage at one point uh, talking with me in front, of an, in front of a class. And we started talking about why he works with sports uh, more than any other part of the industry because basically he's got Rupert Murdoch's rubber stamp. He could do anything he wants at Fox. And he said, you know, the thing about sports is that athletes have a quality about them, uh, at, professional athletes have a quality about them that no one else has. And it boils down to this. We got to talking. We both kind of agreed on this. It boils down to this. And this is something Willie brought up. And, and Toy, I want you to comment on this. Uh, athletes to play in professional sports, athletes had to have done something. You can't just do it on good looks and charm. You have to have put in the work. You have to have prepared yourself. Uh, you, you cannot fake it in professional sports. Uh, Southern California is all about the superficial and all about the image, and much of what we're talking about here involves the, uh, the league's image. But there's something at the core of athletes, is there not, uh, that goes beyond image and that goes to actual character? Um, yes. Uh, I think when you listen to all the stories, I mean, uh, from, you know, Lewis uh, or Shelby, uh, talking about where he came from and, and Mark talking about what he had to go through and Matt and I mean we all come from different and it's funny I think I'm the only one that was drafted in the eighth round up here <laughs> I think first round first round first round first round I wasn't drafted, drafted. And yeah. <laughs> seven, oh, seventh round seventh round yeah. right but we all packed in Cal <laughs> Berkeley and Stanford um, USC and USC uh, no it, Listen, it, you know, the beautiful thing about, about sports, and, and, you know, listen to Matt, you know, because everyone talks about Kurt Warner, but does everyone know Kurt Warner's story? Uh, you know, if Trent Green doesn't blow out his knee in the final preseason game, we may not know about Kurt Warner. Kurt Warner steps into the Rams to play, they end up winning the Super Bowl, right? So Matt uh, or Mark is completely correct in, it's, it's all luck of the draw. I mean, I'm telling you, I mean, I was lucky. I, I played eight-man football at Montclair Prep, right, a little private school in the Valley. Uh, I wanted to go to SC, but they didn't, they, didn't know, they, didn't hear, they didn't know about me. They'd already given out all their scholarships. They wanted me to play baseball. My, my actual, my, my host here was Jack Del Rio, who was a baseball football guy. So 
I actually went to Stanford because they offered me a full scholarship. I could have come to SC and played baseball where you get a half scholarship, walked on the football. They thought I would become a starter maybe the next year and get a football scholarship. But Stanford's like, come to Stanford. You can go. You can play. So I happened to go there. The first two people I see is uh, this guy, Joe Kane from Compton, who was 6'2", 225. I'm like, what position do you play? He's like, I'm a safety. And the next guy I see is a guy named Marshall Dillard, who was 6'4", 235 or 245. I'm like, what position do you play? And he's like, I'm a fullback. And I was like, oh, my God, what did I get myself into? But, but what happens is you get on the field, and everything is equal. And I always hear people every single time say, oh, my kid is too small, or he's not fast enough. And I'm telling you, every time that someone tells you that you cannot do something, and it's legal, <laughs> right, uh, <laughs> you're you're moving in the right direction. Because if I'd have sat back and thought about you know, being 5'11", 190 pounds, I would have talked myself out of there's no way I could cover Willie Gault who ran track. Right? I, you just get Chris Hale who's sitting right here, Pasadena, right? three Super Bowls with the Buffalo Bills. Right? Chris, how tall are you? 5'8", 170. 5'8", 170. I'm bigger than you are. Right? <laughs> but here, but here, <laughs> But here's a guy that, that didn't listen to what people said, right? And that, that's what sports is, is really all about. I mean, I ended up playing 11 years in the, in the NFL, uh, in, I don't know, the National Football League. And of my 11 years, I was the player rep, because I know at some point we're going to talk about the lockout. But I was the player rep, and the only reason I became the player rep is because you got two free first-class tickets to Hawaii, right? And, and I said, oh, I'll go. But at first I said, you know, because back then, if you were the rep, you got cut. Right? <laughs> so I was like, because Hobie Brenner, another great SC tight end, is the one that recruited me to be the player rep because I was so vocal. My 1987, we went on strike. And that was my first year. But I was so vocal because I had covered Ken Mardrum, you know, and, uh, and Mike Wilson at, at Stanford when I was in college. So I already knew that I could play. And Ronnie Lott, another great SC player, told me that I could play in the NFL. Mm -hmm. The power of words. So here I am at Stanford, and I got Ronnie Lott saying, you could play in the league. Well, that's all I had to hear. It didn't matter what round I was drafted in. In fact, when we went to training camp, you know, everyone takes like the one little duffel bag. I brought everything, right? Because I just knew I was like Forrest Gump. I just knew I was Stan. I had no clue that, you know, everybody's like, why are you? As soon as I got the tour, are you playing on Stan? I'm like, of course. What are you talking about? And I ended up playing and Stan, but really it was all because, you know, as a player, once you're on the field, it's, it's just you against the other person. And, and the cream is always going to rise to the top. So uh, once again, we, and we talk about David Hill. Mm -hmm. I got to go do NFL Europe game. Yeah. I, I did one little thing on that football field with Jimmy Johnson. We were talking about Deion Sanders. Uh, and I talked about Deion. And after I get, and we did three takes because Jimmy Johnson messed up three times. I gave three different <laughs> stories. And then after they called me in there and they, you know, David Hill was like, you know, you're you're freaking, I was, I was, I'll use the, you're yeah. freaking great, mate. You're freaking great. <laughs> you ever think about doing games? So and of course, I say, I can't be on the sideline because that's really, that's hard work being on the sidelines. But what I can do is I can discuss the game. So we want to send you to Europe. So they send me to Europe. <coughs> and I do the games. I come back. Jim, uh, David, uh, Ed Gorn offers me, because mm -hmm. Jimmy Johnson would, had quit to go, coach the, uh, go back to coach the Miami Dolphins. And he said, how would you like to be on the NFL you know, show. Mm -hmm. And it was my ninth season. I said, well, I always wanted to play 10 season. Uh, thanks, but no thanks. But the guy you should really talk to is Ronnie Lott, right? Because if you ever sat with Ronnie Lott and you said, ask him about football, he'd be like, boom, 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 boom. Now, it's a little bit different when that red light goes on, mm -hmm. right? And you got a producer in your ear. But if you, if Ronnie was up here, I mean, he's, he's fantastic. The long story short is next time that the head of the network asks you to take a job, do it. <laughs> <laughs> Always good idea. I'll remember that. I just got to get ahead of a network to say, take this job. That'd be, uh, well, you, you brought this up, and let's, let's get to talking about some of this now. There are three real issues that seem to be the core, uh, at least certainly some of the most public issues that the NFL is dealing with right now. Number one is the lockout and the state of the game on the lockout. Uh, and since we have two guys here who are being impacted by that, I want to get, get their opinion on it. But there are a couple of other things that I want to talk about as well. 
Um, there have been two recent suicides uh, involving NFL players, or former NFL players, Kenny McKinley last fall, and Dave Durst in the spring, which brought up a number of questions involving health, mental and physical of players, especially players uh, who may be uh, ending their careers or in danger of ending their careers. And there also, of course, is the Michael Vick situation, which is a, which is a, a bit of a circus uh, all unto itself. Uh, but has caused considerable negative press for the NFL. First of all, just as, as a, an opinion here, Lee, which one of these do you think really is the most troubling uh, concern for the NFL right now? The most troubling concern for the NFL is the long-term health of the players. Mm -hmm. And um, remember that most players are in a state of denial. They, they play Pop Warner, they play Little League, they accept a, a norm, a set of standards that's totally different than we would. Um, Long-term health and abstraction, they're all valiant warriors, they'll play under all situations. You know, there was a time when, um, when the 49ers had played the uh, Dallas Cowboys for the right to go to the Super Bowl. And I was representing Steve Young and Troy Aikman. Well, Steve loses the game, so my great job is to go console Steve Young. <laughs> And Troy won the game, but suffered a concussion. And he was sitting in a darkened hospital room in Dallas. And I walked in. The whole city was awash in celebration. They were going to the Super Bowl. And Troy had played brilliantly. So no one's there. He's sitting alone. There are fireworks going off in the background. He looks at me and he said, um, uh, what am I doing here? And I said, you know, you had a concussion. And he said, uh, did I play today? And I said, yeah, you, you played. He said, did I play well? Yeah. What's that mean? You're going to go to the Super Bowl, Troy. Well, his face brightened, and he got very excited. Um, five minutes passed, and he looked at me blankly and said, um, where am I? And I answered that question. What am I doing here? And he asked the same sequence of questions all over again. And five minutes more passed, then the same thing happened all over again. And it terrified me because I saw how tender the bond was between sentient consciousness and dementia. And um, I thought, I can no longer represent players in the NFL unless I take this concussion issue and get um, information for players as to what the long-term consequences are. Well, in the 90s, I held three concussion and player safety conferences, and the big was representing half the starting quarterbacks at that point in the league, and they all came. We did it in Newport Beach, and we pushed to get um, AstroTurf pulled out of every stadium. We pushed to have a standardized regimen of, of diagnosis. Mm -hmm. um, not much change. We started again about four years ago, and I finally invited because we're at Annenberg, oh. <laughs> the Washington Post, the New York Times, CNN, uh, Reuters, uh, uh, every major media group in the country. And we finally got the results out that show that three or more concussions um, is the magic number. And that triggers an exponentially higher rate of Alzheimer's, premature senility, dementia. There's an, uh, one allele of uh, genotype that can mm -hmm. lead to the Duerson deal, if you have that mm -hmm. genotype. And, the, and we pushed really hard, and I called it a <coughs> ticking time bomb and an undiagnosed health epidemic. Undiagnosed because when I gave the speech for Warren Moon at the Hall of Fame, they allow you to go to that same, uh, you can go to the same luncheon. And I looked around, it was the most painful thing I've ever seen to mm -hmm. see every great player who's ever been in the Hall of Fame walking around, and I'd given the presenting speech for, for Warren, it, it was t terrifying. So I thought, look, I can't do this as a career unless we prioritize this. The athletes are not going to take care of themselves. They're valiant and all the rest of it. And so finally, um, Warren Moon went to Roger Goodell and took the results and said, we got to do something. And we made it so public that they couldn't deny it anymore. They put a, a physician's conference together and uh, had the first um, 
rule that said that players needed to look out for each other. And now the Berlin Wall's fallen. But this is true uh, on every part of, of player health. And any of you who have kids, make sure that they're baseline tested at the beginning of the year. They get an objective test. So then when you have the second concussion, you have a way of judging. And the player should be asymptomatic at rest, asymptomatic on an exercise cycle, asymptomatic at practice before he ever goes in. Because if you get two together, it's a, it's a deal. So I think, whoops. Boy, I spilled my tooth out. That's the, I think that is the, the biggest single issue. Mm -hmm. 18 games, there's not going to be 18 games. Yeah. It's not even healthy for players. It's mm -hmm. ridiculous. You know, you'd have more injuries and they'd look like the preseason games. Mm -hmm. um, the rookie salary cap, I thought the funniest thing was when the union told the top 17 players not to go to New York. Mm -hmm. Because the union proposal is that the money is taken away from those top draft picks and given to proven productive starters. Now nobody has been a greater beneficiary of big rookie contracts than I have. I've had 60 first round draft picks, I've had the first pick in the draft eight times, the second seven times. Sent My kid is going to SC film school right now because of rookie contracts. <laughs> <laughs> it's about the only way you can afford it, frankly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, um, but, but who could rationally ever say that you should take unproven, unproductive players and give them $40 million in bonus at the top of the first round or $30 million at the top, as opposed to proven productive starters. How could you ever argue that? Well, um, so look who's going to be negotiating. Veteran players who want the money for them, mm -hmm. the management that wants the money to go to anywhere but rookies mm -hmm. and I was telling Mark before you know the draft's not real exact in 1999 the first player in the draft was Tim Couch now by rights he should be a great player right now you know 32 mm -hmm. 33 years old out of football third pick in that draft Akili Smith out of football Cade McNown from SE's favorite school um, <laughs> and the, uh, out of football tenth pick uh, Dante Culpepper, out of football. That's four quarterbacks in the top 12 picks. All are not playing. You know, the rookie, it's an inexact science. It's mm -hmm. an inexact science. So really, those issues are all solved. It comes down to money. And um, when I started representing athletes in 1976, two teams came into the NFL. They were Seattle and Tampa Bay. They had a $16.5 million purchase price. In 1995, two more teams came into the league. They were Carolina and Jacksonville, $130 million as a purchase price. Houston came into the league in 2000 and had a $650 million purchase price. And today, the average franchise in the NFL is worth a billion dollars. The TV contract has gone through the roof. It's gone from $2 million per team when I started to $130 million and there are more ancillary revenue streams. So cutting up this money is not the biggest deal in the world. What we're seeing is what we saw in 87. Mm -hmm. uh, players can't strike. They're not great strikers. They're, they're not exactly like the Bolshevik Revolution. But, okay. Okay. but th th this group is better. Okay. Yeah. But they're not great strikers. You know, they have short playing careers. They mm -hmm. get injured. They don't have a tradition of winning. A lot of them are coaches' kids. Some born-again Christians don't want to defy authority. There's a whole lot of reasons why they're not uh, great strikers. But they're devastatingly good in court. And what they did in 87 is they decertified. They won the court case. And Tim McDonald, if he's here, was part of the – Tim, are you still here? No. From an overflow. Um, Tim, Tim, <laughs> Tim, Tim, who's <laughs> back at Annenberg and whose son plays for the SC team, was part of the um, Reggie White mm -hmm. case. They knocked out free agency and they negotiated the current system. Mm -hmm. yeah, and so that's what's going to happen right now is when it gets time, the season starts to be imperiled, you will get people going to their bottom line. Yeah. But, but real quick, you – even though he says that, you know, this lockout right now impacts you guys, really it's about when you retire. Because at mm -hmm. one point, 
we all become retired players, mm -hmm. and it's all about benefits. Mm -hmm. That's why I said health Absolutely. is the yeah, biggest right. issue. So, it, so that's that's the most important is is at some point you're going to be retired, mm -hmm. and the average lifespan of a player is 55. Yeah. 55. I think of like an American is like 82. Mm -hmm. Right. 55. But for you, 54.99. Thank, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. So I got to get on the. Yeah, <laughs> get on the extra cycle. And that is, that is a concern. Actually, it's a concern that, that has been a, a long-standing conversation here at Annenberg uh, and a concern of mine uh, because, as you know, also, uh, most players don't have 12-year careers. And as Lee just said, uh, most players end up being out of the league earlier than they think. Most players don't make millions and millions and millions of dollars. Uh, very often they end up with, with almost nothing left over from their career. And they have to transition into post-career life uh, without, uh, you know, without a, any kind of safety net set by the, uh, the NFL per se. So you have, a, you have a, a very difficult situation for players who, who do not have extensive careers. Uh, and, and in this case, Shelby, you, are, you have moved on from a, a playing career that was successful to a very successful career in, in civic life. Uh, what are your concerns uh, uh, about the transition? How did the transition work for you, and, and what are the biggest difficulties you find in that? For me, I think primarily because my orientation, as I said earlier, was that I had learned how to work when I was a, a very young person, and so I thought that that's what every healthy adult did, work, have a job. Football's a sport. That's fun. It's nice to have someone pay you to do something that you enjoy doing. But it was more important for me to maintain a perspective that each day that I went to work was not an investment in a career. It was actually showing up and being responsible for an opportunity. And that there was a number of things that I had no control over that would determine how long that opportunity would present itself to me. So I never lost view of what it meant to be able to get out there on Sundays and play because I had seen a number of players lose their careers in practice. So I saved my money. My first year in football, I lived in a low rent tenement house to save my money so that I could go to grad school and uh, was determined that I wasn't going to spend my savings during the off season. I, I like to tell people that, that I try to keep my automobiles at least 10 years and put at least 200,000 miles on each of them. <laughs> uh, and it was a, a mid-sized car that was not an expensive car. But I was interested in learning more than I knew in order to help myself protect what I was making. In many cases, a lot of young people who are having these opportunities presented to themselves to play in the National Football League are not coming from families that have a great deal of experience with wealth. And so oftentimes, they've not had classes that would allow them to learn financial literacy. And in most cases, in all cases, they're having to trust someone to advise them. They've not had mentors along the way in many cases. And so by the time they do find someone whom they can trust, they may have had an upbringing where people were making decisions on their behalf for them as they were growing up. And of course, in order to learn how to handle responsibility, someone has to actually give you a responsibility and allow you to fail or succeed at it and then you know, be able to tell you what went wrong but still give you another opportunity to try it by yourself. For me, I, I always maintain an interest in others. You know, I said I was a defensive player all through college and made small college All-American as a linebacker, but shucks, you know, an offensive lineman basically plays in obscurity. You know, that's, that's a position only a wife and a mother know who's down there. <laughs> you know, a good day for me is when the announcer doesn't call my name. I mean, I wasn't doing anything wrong. It's actually a wife and a mother and a smart quarterback. And a smart quarterback. Yeah. So my ego wasn't tied up in the fact that I was playing pro football. I was excited about being a part of a team, a unit of men who all worked hard and sacrificed together for one common goal. And every time we 
We won a game. I couldn't tell you 30 minutes after the game was over what the score was. All I knew is that we put it in the win column, and that's pretty much how I view my life today. I live it competitively. I get in the gym and a couple of men that I see early in the morning at 4 o'clock in the morning, 4.30 in the morning at the Equinox up in Rolling Hills. <laughs> and I say to them, I say, did you get everything you wanted out of it today? They say, well, yeah. I say, well, I'm still trying to figure out how much I want to get out of it today. But then I told them, I say, don't get dismayed. When you show up, it's like a football game. Once it goes into the record books, no one needs to know whether the game was won in the last few seconds. They don't need to know if it was a come-from-behind victory. They all, only thing they want to know, did you put the win, did you put the, the mark in the win column? And that's how I think an orientation needs to be given to young people as they move through their athletic careers, that life is about opportunities. And how we see ourselves in those opportunities as we approach them pretty much will make the difference of whether we will succeed or whether we will fail, because with football, there's always the next play, see, until the game is over. And then there's always the next game. Mm -hmm. So if you're not satisfied with your performance and you have the courage to critique yourself, which all successful football players are honest enough and they have enough courage to critique themselves, then you're always looking and finding something that you can become better at. And so what you want to do is to help young people understand, keep getting up every day, putting the mark in the win column, because every time that you go face the world, you're winning. Sounds good. Um, you know, speaking, sure. <laughs> for an audience at a communication school, you people are far too shy. <laughs> Feel free to applaud at any time. Uh, uh, <laughs> thank you. That was the worst smattering of applause I've ever heard. <laughs> Uh, that, speaking of the, uh, the lockout and its impact on people and uh, injuries, I know Matt and Mark, both of you have suffered very serious injuries in, in really relatively brief careers uh, so far. And, and both of you have had to deal with that and deal with coming back from injuries uh, and also have had to deal with um, currently with the lockout situation. Uh, you know, as you look forward to your career, how do you deal with the constant threat of injury? And as you see a Dave Dewerson uh, or a Kenny McKinley, uh, it, who for different reasons, but not dissimilar reasons, uh, committed suicide, um, how do you deal with the, the difficulty of that moving ahead in, in a career in football in which Lee has just noted, you're not uh, hoping that you don't get a, a concussion, you're looking to see when you get your second one and potentially your third. How do you deal with that kind of threat and that kind of pressure? Let's, let's start with uh, Mark over and then Matt. <clears throat> okay. Um, I think when you start talking about injuries that, I don't know if Matt feels the same way, but as a competitor and a player, I feel like those are almost in the cards. When they're supposed to happen, they happen. And mm -hmm. Um, if you're supposed to play 15 years and never get hurt and, you know, survive on, um, you know, just stretching and icing and everything's fine and you never get hurt, then great. And you really lucked out and that's the way it was supposed to happen. If in your first year you dislocate your patella tendon and, um, you know, you got to get surgery at the end of the year, that's the way it goes. If uh, you hurt your shoulder in Pittsburgh, that's the way it goes. It's supposed to happen. And, um, you know, you take all the necessary precautions. You watch the veterans. I'm sure Matt watched Kurt Warner. I watched Brunel, uh, Ladanian Tomlinson. I mean, these guys are stretching before practice, doing everything they possibly can to get ready for that practice, for that game, and put themselves in the best situation to succeed. Um, and then once you get on the field, it's, it's either going to happen or it's not. You can't be thinking about it. I think long-term effects, especially as a young player, um, you know, and, and it's, it's almost we're so competitive that they say you have a concussion. You're like, I don't have a concussion. What are you talking about? You have a concussion. I don't got a concussion. I'm playing. You know, that's just the way. That's your initial reaction, and that's fine. You want to play, but that's why there has to be those necessary precautions by the league, uh, by committees, to take a baseline test of, of, you know, how well are you going to score on this concussion test when you're, you know, totally normal. And then after you've been hit a couple times, okay, now how do you score? Okay, where do where do we draw the line here, so we don't have these long term effects that. They affect individual people. They affect their families and the NFL as a whole. And it, it looks bad, mm -hmm. you know, for the league when you see um, injuries that turn into 
suicidal deaths later mm -hmm. on. It's, it's really sad. And um, so I'm glad that they're taking those kind of precautions, and it's important for us as young players to buy into those, to, to understand that they are helping us in the long run, and do everything we possibly can to succeed that day, that practice, that game, and understand that there is a bigger picture. We're going to be you know, uh, family men. Hopefully we're going to be talking on a panel like this in a few <laughs> years with uh, you know, a wife and kids, and we're looking back that, yeah, you know, I'm glad I did those baseline tests, and I'm glad I had that doctor check me out. Um, it's, it's important stuff. So um, I guess just buying into it and then understanding that injuries are a part of the game and you kind of just sign up for it. Okay, uh, I, I want to uh, ask Matt about this, but a, a quick follow-up before I do, for either one of you, uh, the, the changes in the rules concerning hits this season, do you think that had a major impact or, or not? And it, just honestly. Um, I mean, it, it definitely changed um, the perception of quarterbacks, I mean, even more. They're already, you know, you're the prima donna, yeah. you're, you know, this China doll out there, and now it's like, you, what are you going to wear, flags out there, and we get to pull your flag? I mean, you hear that from other guys. Yeah. And it's, you know, it's sad, it's almost embarrassing, but at the same time, I mean, people want to see a game that's, you know, 45 to 38. They want to see long passes down the field. They have skinnier hash marks, so the field, the ball's always in the middle, so you score more points. I don't know if anybody's started to realize that, but you keep the ball in the middle of the field, there's more offense, it's tougher for the defense to cover. They're trying to sell tickets, it's, it's a money game. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of the way it goes. So. Um, you want you want the New England Patriots to score 45 points? Well, Tom Brady's probably going to have to be healthy. So it's just kind of the give and take. Quarterbacks take a lot of flack for it, but that's kind of the way it goes. I, I don't know how you feel about it, Manny. Go ahead. Um, I think, I mean, just like Mark said, I mean, they're, they're obviously every year there's more and more rules for the quarterbacks, protecting the quarterbacks. And um, obviously, I, we, I mean, I'm sure we agree with them, but – um, we are vulnerable. I mean, players are vulnerable out there at times. And as a quarterback, you know, we're focused on executing our play, throwing the ball down the field. We're not really looking at the 6'6", 300-pound dude who's running a 4'5", coming from our <laughs> blind side, you know. And obviously, that's what we – the tackles, and we, we trust in them that they're going to get the job done. But um, like Mark said, it, it's, a, it's a physical game. I mean, we know what we're signing up for. And I know not once have I ever entered a game scared to get injured, you know. and, and Kind of going back to college, everyone, are you, you know, coming back from my senior year, everyone asked, are you scared of getting hurt? I'm like, no, I, I don't think about, you know, getting hurt playing football. I understand it happens, and I've been hurt playing football. But um, as competitors, I mean, this is, I mean, there's no better adrenaline rush than stepping on a football field on game day. I mean, it, it's an unbelievable feeling. And I don't think injury ever creeps into our mind. And we're aware of it, and, you know, we're not ignorant about the issue. Um, but but it's the the competitive nature in us, and um, I think also with the hits too. I mean, I think James Harrison is a perfect example. I mean, he's. Uh, I mean, it's it's a tough call because um, there's definitely unnecessary hits out there, and, and you know the commissioner has done a job where he's he's hand out plenty of fines for some of these guys on the defensive side of the ball, and um, you know I have to say that I agree with some and I don't agree with some, you know, and um, I do think. We are taking the necessary steps, um, you know, in concussion testing and everything to help better this game and to help prevent the injuries. And there's always going to be injuries, unfortunately, and that's, that's the nature of the game. And, um, but I think another key thing that Mark said was the preparation that you take. Um, you know, we're all accountable for ourselves in the offseason, especially this, this year with the lockout. And the proper nutrition, the strength, the, the stretching, the, you know, what you put in your body is the most important thing, you know. And, um, you see so many injuries, you know, I mean, you know so many guys, that, you know, drink during the week during practice or come to practice hungover and, you know, it affects them, their play. And those guys are very easily more likely to tear something or strain a muscle than guys that, you know, hydrate and do all those things. So those are all the little things that you need to take, you know, the, the precautionary steps. And I don't think everyone does, and I think a lot of people do because we all realize that um, it is a job and we're accountable for ourselves in, in our actions. And um, But I definitely think... I mean, I definitely think perfect example is this year uh, or last year, Kurt um, Warner had the concussion. And, um, you know, he was 38 years old towards the end of his career. And I really think that was the deciding point for him to retire. I was hoping he would retire anyway. But uh, <laughs> um, I remember talking to him and, and, you know, he was out for a game and he was, you know, seeing double. And, and that was his first real major, major injury. 
Um, and he was at a point where he has seven kids, a wife, and he was just like, man, I just, you know, it's too, I, I've, I've made my money, I've had success, I've won Super Bowls, I want to be able to take my kids to school in 10 years, I want to be able to go to their games. And I think, you know, he walked away from the game, you know, in a perfect state of mind and, um, and realized that. So, um, you know, it's a, it's, a tough, it's a tough sport, but we all play it because we love it and, you know, we're aware. But he says that Kurt Warner walked away from the, how much was he supposed to make the next year? How much did he walk away from? Do you know how much he walked away from? He was going to make $14 million. $14 million with seven kids. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Two million a piece. Two million, million a kid, yeah. But I mean, think about it. That's, that's how much he cherished, obviously, his faculties, mm -hmm. that he walked away. How many people would walk away from a $14 million contract? Well, I've never met a player that willingly walked away from football. Mm -hmm. And people... They get injured, they can't play anymore, teams don't want them. Um, and then people would say, well, what about Troy Aikman? Or what about, well, you don't, if you represented them and, and uh, four <coughs> games into the season they're saying, oh, my God, why did I retire? I want to play, I want to play, I want to play. These are the most competitive people on the face of the earth. And part of the problem is nothing seems to, as much preparation as we do, and I'll ask an athlete when he walks in my office, what other skills do you have besides athletic ones that we can uh, work on? And so then they do the charitable and community fairs. And when you get players out the other end, like I've had Hall of Fame, Troy Aikman, Steve Young, Warren Moon, Bruce Smith, Derek Thomas, Thurman Thomas, Howie Long, um, these players come out and they're able to be television commentators. They're able to be the CEOs of business. They're able to um, have their charitable foundation. This is not the era any longer of Joe Lewis, you know, being a greeter in front of Las Vegas. The players that take seriously the opportunities they have. Football is the most popular sport for middle-aged men. And our business rests on the irrationality <laughs> of middle-aged men. Mm -hmm. And because of that, any player that really taps <coughs> into that through their charities, through what they do, can have a tremendous career mm -hmm. afterwards. Mm -hmm. And the one thing I wanted to say about timing is um, the point that Mark and Matt made, is that was right even in the life of Troy Aikman. Troy Aikman retires, and Matt Millen, who's the number two commentator at Fox, decides to go run the Detroit Lions. That opened up that position, and Troy now becomes part of the number two team. And we made sure that there were three men in the booth because it was his first year, and we didn't. If you have two men in the booth, you have to. The color guy talks after every play. If you have three people in the booth, then it's every other play. And we thought that would be a much easier uh, deal for him. So then, the year after that. John Madden decides that he's going to Monday Night Football, and all of a sudden, Troy Aikman, two years into his career, is the number one color guy on Fox. Mm -hmm. And so timing is helpful, but preparation is, is also. And, and these players all made sure they had charitable foundations. They'd gone back to their high school, college, professional. The way I look at it is the two things that I do of value in the world are to help stimulate the best values in young men and help them make a meaningful difference in the world. And I don't think the world will long note nor remember the size of the country. Lee, I, I also just interject, uh, if I may. Um, I think there are opportunities for the star players, but also I, I want to talk about the guys who are, you know, maybe second team, third team, or walk-ons. Those are very small opportunities, but those guys can do things. Like, for instance, they can get involved with their community as far as businesses. And the thing that we try to do in the, when I was in Chicago, and Chicago is a great city, is that we try to get involved with businesses. And I think that's the most, thing, the best thing you can do. Actually, do internships in the off season. You know, get relationship with those businesses because at some point you're not going to be playing football. And if you didn't make the millions of dollars, then you don't have a nest egg to be able to sit back on. So I think those things are very important. I think the league can do a better job and players can do a better job as far as getting those relationships because, you know, again, we can't play forever. And you look at it and you put it in perspective. There's over 300 million people in our country. 
1,600 football players. You know, they're, they're regular people. They're going to make mistakes. The Michael Vick's going to make mistakes. That's, you know, it's a mistake. There's someone else in Mississippi who did the same thing or, or wherever. But it's, it's heightened because he's on a national stage. But I think sometimes we tend to put athletes and celebrities on this high pedestal, in which, you know, that's okay. But I think guys have to make choices, and people have to make choices. It's all about choices. I get up this morning, I made the choice to come here. I made the choice to put on a suit. You know, I made the choice to come here. So we all have to make choices. If we make the right choices, then we're okay. If we make the wrong choices, then everyone will hear about it. But it's all about choices. It comes down to, is he going to make the choice to do what he needs to do? Is he going to make the choice to do what he needs to do in the offseason? You know, those things are, you know, what you have to think about. You work hard. You play hard. You go out there. It's, a, it's an amazing sport that we've been very blessed to play. I mean, how many people would like to play a sport that they, get, they enjoy playing and get paid for? I mean, every guy in here is... Play, want to play football or play football or want to hit something or want to get hit or want to whatever. And that's what football is all about. That's what America is all about. I'd really rather not get right, hit. Right. Well, it's, it's all the well, same to you. Hit somebody. <laughs> and, and it's, just, it's the same thing in Europe. People kick balls. That's soccer. That's what they do. I mean, guys, girls. So in America, that's why football is so big is that everyone want to hit something or be hit or see someone hit something or whatever. And that's what football is all about. It's fun. And that's what we do. And, but I think it's our responsibility. We can't blame on anyone else. I mean, the league has a responsibility, but each player has their own responsibility to make their decision. They make their decision. Now, we can uh, help that decision, or we can aid them by you know, letting them do the bad thing and, and actually rewarding them. But we have to be accountable. If we can be accountable, then everything will be much better. But when you reward someone for doing something bad, then you're going to get bad things to happen. That's just my personal opinion. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right, this conversation could go on. Yeah. <laughs> This conversation could go on for the better part of the next three hours, and I have yet to get bored, which is a surprising thing because I get bored at the drop of a hat. Uh, so I, I could go on forever, uh, but we, we are going to, we are already well past our time. So I want to conclude just by asking around uh, each person uh, really quickly in, in a sentence or two what you think uh, the next best step uh, for the NFL and NFL players would be. And we'll start with Mark. Wow. And uh, I'm putting you on the spot because Jeez. I know no uh, <laughs> you're a communication scholar. You, you took you took classes from the best the professors in lately. communication in the history of the universe. So you should be able to come up with it off the top of your head, impromptu, uh, all the way down to Shelby. Here. Well, I, I do think the most important thing is to reach an agreement. Um, and as optimistic as I am, I know it will happen. I'm sure it will happen before the season. And you throw around the number nine billion dollars is what the NFL total revenue is, for $9 billion, I think we'll f figure something out. And we're making the right steps. Um, guys are training hard in the off season. We're optimistic about having a season, but I think that's the most important thing, whether it's to get an injunction and the players go back to work under uh, you know, the old rules, or we get a new uh, CBA in place. It's got to happen soon, and, and I think that's what everybody is really pushing for. So that's the most important step. Really? Uh, I have two things. Uh, the difference between the players and the ownership, I think, should go in a fund for the retired players and the older players for health insurance, mm -hmm. for insurance and all those things, and a better um, uh, pension. That's what I think should happen. And that way, the deal is settled and done. Secondly, I think there should be uh, mandatory testing of EKGs and heart because, you know, it, and I played 12 years in the National Football League. I never got a treadmill EKG test which I think is tragic. Mm -hmm. And that's what my charity is all about, Athlete for Life, is uh, attacking heart problem because it's the number one killer. It kills more people than diseases two, three, eight combined. So I'd like to see that happen. Good. Um, I mean, I guess just to echo that, I think the, the number one thing is just, we, I mean, we just want to play. You know, as players, um, this is what we love to do. And um, unfortunately, it is a business and it is about money, but I think I mean, I think I'm like Mark. I'm optimistic. You know, we don't know when, um, so we're doing everything necessary to be prepared for when when that agreement is reached. But I think it's just everyone kind of kind of needs to put their egos aside and just let's just get this deal done. Football is the greatest sport in the world, and the fans love it. We love it, and I'm all you know for Willie too, with, with obviously improving the health care of retired players and the pensions and. Um, and, and I just hope, I hope everyone kind of sees the big picture of this whole thing, both sides, and, um, you know, in protecting the, the game and the, the integrity of the sport. And um, real quickly, we had a, 
um, through my charity, we just found, we, I do a youth football league for the inner city LA and, and Santa Ana, and um, we have doctors that just found like two kids with heart murmurs, three kids that have juvenile diabetes, um, a homeless kid who's playing in the league, a, ki a kid that's tried to commit suicide one time already, and these are you know seventh and eighth graders. So it can be done. These steps can be done, and I think the NFL needs to do that and, and take the proper testing and, and uh, improve the sport because it's a, a great sport. Uh, I'm going to take this opportunity to throw in my two cents worth on these subjects and not the NFL. <laughs> uh, I want everybody up here who's got their own charity or involved in uh, pursuing a charity, uh, I'd like uh, all of your information sent to us. One of the things we've been doing at the Annenberg Institute for Sports Media and Society uh, is looking into ways that we can better uh, help publicize and, and make well known the many charities athletes are involved in. Uh, and we're trying to gather together information on them so we can, we can help. And not, not for your public image per se, but to help get these things noticed because very often these, these are the, the extra things of your careers that aren't noticed uh, when people are looking at the, the game itself. So I would like you to pass on your information to us uh, of all the charities you're working with uh, and we, we will uh, we'll do all that we can to help, to help publicize those. Thank all right. You. Thank you very much. No problem. Toy. Um, I'm going to echo what they all said, uh, you know, especially Willie being the retired players. Uh, you know, it's all about the, the benefits and, and long-term long -term health insurance. When I retired, uh, you got two years of health insurance. Uh, I think it's up to five, five. For, for now. Uh, but I'm sure, you know, Shelby, we'd all like, we think, especially when you're going to die at 55, which, yeah. you know, you'd like long -term. We, we, we hope not. <laughs> yeah, I hope not. <laughs> My kids will not. But we want long-term health insurance. But that being said, uh, these guys are way far more ahead than the players that when I came to the league in 1987, we went on strike. Our best players crossed the line. Howie Long, uh, Joe Montana. Uh, Lawrence Taylor. Lawrence yeah. Taylor, Roger yeah. Craig. Uh, uh, the Jets, uh, Gaston, no. right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, it, it's very hard to negotiate a deal when your best players are crossing the line. Conversely, this group of guys, you know, Drew Brees is on the executive committee, uh, Peyton Manning, uh, Tom Brady are named plaintiffs in this lawsuit. So they've done a really, really good job of uh, binding together the retired players and the active players. In the past, you know, you had the, I was on the executive committee, they now have two retired players uh, on the executive committee. So the bottom line is they have to get into a room and they're going to have to negotiate a deal. The good news is if you have these stadiums like Jerry Jones and you have these sponsors that have already committed dollars to you, right, and you're going to the networks and you're saying just for Monday Night Football, that's a billion dollars <laughs> for one game a week, a billion dollars. They have to play the game. That's the good news. And the good news is I think they are, they're doing everything correctly to move forward. So uh, health care and just get to the table and discuss it. Um, I'm going to answer a question you didn't ask so, it, okay. so I can get out of here afterwards. Um, the, 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 <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, uh, the, Anschutz, um, uh, the, the anschutz Liawecki proposal for mm -hmm. a new downtown stadium is the best chance we have ever had to get football back in Los Angeles. I was chairman of Save the Rams um, and did such an excellent job. They've been <laughs> playing in St. Louis. Save them for St. Louis. Uh, you know, for all these years, but, but um, that is the first proposal I've seen that gets political leadership, media leadership, one site, one venue all together and lined up. And so have hope because, you know, we've had this whole discussion about the NFL. We only have 17 million people who can um, get the signal over television. So, of course, uh, Jacksonville, which is the 55th largest market, got a franchise before we did. Um, <laughs> What needs to happen in the collective bargaining agreement is that public discussion about the issues needs to stop because it will hurt the brand. This will end. There will be a great deal. In my view, it's unconscionable 
to conclude this deal without taking care of veteran retired players who built the game. I mean, they, they, this game didn't start in 2011. And if you see the shape these people are in, it, it, it defies conscience not to help them. Um, and second of all, they need to prioritize the health issues because um, every player is going to walk out of this game with a fair amount of financial largesse. It's one thing to know you'll have aches and pains and bend over to pick up your child when the child, when the adult turns 50. It's another thing not to be able to recognize um, that child. Mm -hmm. And lastly, I just say the charity I've worked with um, takes middle school and high school kids um, and from different ethnic groups and puts them together so they can uh, spend a series of time in their summer camps, cherish the cultural differences, learn how to grow up in a state that's going to be multi-racial uh, and multi-ethnic, and, and stop bigotry and stop skinheads. First, I'd like to thank Professor Durbin for the opportunity to be a part of this distinguished thank you group of being. panelists. <laughs> uh, I can't... Uh, You know, I'm, I'm a tremendous fan of, of both you, Sanchez, and Leonard, and, and looking forward to enjoying a lot more games and watching you be successful. You know, James Michener in his book that he writes, Sports in America, says that sports in America is important because it, it's an, it's that it is an integral part of our society because it gives young people an opportunity to do something successful or good at an early age. And if the people who are responsible for coaching them and guiding them takes the confidence that the young people get from their accomplishments at an early age and helps them to transfer those experiences into other areas of their lives and they're likely to attempt to try to do things that they would never, otherwise never tried and, and that goes in terms of academics as well as other sports. If ever there was a time in the history of the world the elevation of the visibility of sports, especially football at this time, may be fortuitous, not just for the men who will receive the higher salaries, but for the millions and millions of people who need to see leadership in action. There's a whole group of young men who will arrive at training camp who will never know what it's like to run out on that field during a regular season game. And there's more of those young men who will have to decide what to do with the rest of their lives. And there's a lot of value that these young men have, having had the experiences of being in highly competitive programs, probably from when they were young children up through teenage years and, and on through college. And I don't think that we're getting the most out of those young men and their attributes. Joshua Cooper Ramos, who was formerly with Times and now with the Kissinger Groups, writes the book at the age of the unthinkable. And if you've read it, you understand now that there's a transition occurring all over the globe. And here we have an opportunity as the Americans to take a sport that has so much popularity, transfer some of those intrinsic values that we've all talked about this evening into a realm that no one had ever conceivably thought of. As education is being discussed in a lot of different places, public education is being discussed in a lot of different venues at this particular time. All of these young people whom we're concerned with getting a good education, many of whom will arrive at major institutions of higher learning with aspirations both of becoming a happy, productive human being in society as well as being a happy, productive, well-paid athlete. And I'm just saying there's a confluence carrying that, that can take place, emerging of all of these various attributes that can take place and benefit not just the United States of America, but benefit the world overall. Ladies and gentlemen, you could pay the unpaid salary to Kurt Warner $14 million and you would not be able to, uh, to field a panel better than this to discuss this subject. So I want to thank Mark Sanchez, Willie Galt, Matt Lyman, Tom Cook, Lee Steinberg, and Shelby Jordan.
And it's been a very long evening. I want to thank you very much. There's a reception upstairs. Go get yourself a bite to eat and a little something to drink. Thank you for your time. Thank you.